you know, I, I think folks know that, you know, we regulate pesticides. And our mission is sort of a three-pronged approach. We're, we are about the protection of human life and the environment, as people use uh, legal pesticides. But we have a third prong, and that's to foster reduced use, reduced risk. So, you know, and that takes on all kinds of interesting twists and turns. Uh, my name is Lori Brakovich. I am the, um, I kind of lead, and I'm also the supervisor for the school IPM program here at um, Department of Pesticide Regulation. Um, my presentation is really going to focus on what the California Healthy Schools Act is about, kind of the history of it, um, telling you about the requirements of it, um, and then also what we do here at DPR to help schools. I want to first introduce um, my staff that's here today, and I'm going to ask them each to stand up so you can meet each of them and put the name with the face. Um, I have Allison Fish, who's an environmental scientist here, Lisa Estridge, an environmental scientist, Belinda Messenger, who is actually our child care program coordinator. Um, and then Tom Babb, who's not here today. Um, he's at a meeting. And that's, if you call our department, you're probably going to get one of those people, because we're the ones that are dealing with the schools and um, are on the school IPM program. Now I want to go into um, the California Healthy Schools Act, um, just so you know what we're talking about today and so you understand the law. The, um, the law was enacted in 2001. It's a, a basically a right to know law that lets parents know um, what's going on in the school if the school is using pesticides. So it requires the school to do mandatory um, notifications and um, record keeping. It also has a voluntary component um, where it encourages the school to do IPM. At the time it was enacted, um, it, it affects um, public schools and public child cares. Um, the reason it's, it was passed was because if you think about children, they're different than adults. They're not many adults. They um, are still developing, their organs are still developing, and they're not able to detoxify chemicals and pesticides like adults can. They also have behaviors that you and I probably don't do. We don't pick stuff off the ground and eat it. Um, we're not rolling around on the grass. We're not touching stuff that probably, we, you, you know, kids are always into stuff. Um, so they're constantly in their environment um, and coming in contact with it. Um, the Healthy Schools Act was amended twice in 2006 to prohibit certain pesticides to be used. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that. Um, they're not about toxicity. It's um, on kind of re registration issues, and that list is on our website. It was amended in 2007 to include private child care, se child care centers. So, the act today um, includes public K-12 um, schools, um, and that includes um, about 1,000 um, school districts and about 10,000 school sites. And then we have um, child cares, both public and private, and that's about 15,000 um, child cares. And now, now these are going to be the HSA requirements. So these are the mandatory components that, help, that the schools have to follow. So the first thing is that each school has to identify a school um, designee, or we call the IPM coordinator. This is a person that's going to ensure all the Healthy Schools Act requirements are being met. They also have to do an annual pesticide use notification. Typically, we see that this is going out in the back to school notice. Um, we also, they also have to do a um, notification if parents would like to be on a registry. If you as a parent sign up for that registry, you then, um, that school then has to give you an individual notice um, 72 hours in advance of each application and give you specific information about that. The school also has to post warning signs um, 24 hours before and 72 hours after, and they have to be around the area that's applied. It can't just be up in front of the school district or in front of the school site. They also have to keep pesticide use records on site for four years. This has to be on the site and be readily available if somebody were to ask for it. Um, they shouldn't be at a district office. It shouldn't take a month to get them. Um, so that, again, it's all about right to know. And then seven, avoid those prohibited pesticides. Okay, on this slide, I'm going to talk about pesticides that are exempt from the Healthy Schools Act. So what, these, what that is, is pesticides that are actually encouraged to be used if you have to use the pesticides. Um, now, with IPM, you don't want to go straight to the pesticide, so you should be trying to do those non-pesticide pest management methods first, prevention, exclusion, um, sanitation, as well as um, physical, mechanical, like pulling weeds or using a vacuum to get rid of um, populations of um, pests. Um, but if you do need to use pesticides, these pesticides here um, are exempt from all those requirements we just talked about. 
So there's four different um, categories, I'd say. The first one is self-contained baits or trap. The key there is the pesticide is inside a container that the kid's not going to be able to get to, so it's low exposure. The um, second one is gels or paste that are used in crack and crevice treatments. So the key there is a crack and it's a gel or paste formula, so it's not going to you know uh, run off, and it's um, it's in a place that's a low exposure, so the kid's not going to be able to get to it. And then three is antimicrobials. This is your disinfectants. Um, you know, obviously, a kid gets sick. You want to clean it up as you know soon, and you're not going to want to have to wait 24 hours to notify. And then four pesticide products that contain active or inert ingredients um, that have been exempted from US EPA, US EPA registration. What does that mean? Those are typically your, your botanical ingredients, um, rosemary oil, clove oil. Um, they're kind of food grade, so they're considered very low toxicity. And then the um, Healthy Schools Act um, actually has requirements for us, the Department of Pesticide Regulation. So the law actually says that we must promote and the adoption of IPM in schools. Uh, so how do we do that? We do a lot of training. We'll talk in a few more slides about um, our training and more specifics about that. We also have an IPM guidebook, which is kind of the how to get IPM going in your district, the step by step of that. And then we have lots of resources that are all available on our website. Um, our website has lots of different pages for a specific audience. If you're a parent, if you're a school district employee, um, or even if you're a pest control business that works with the school district. And then we also collect pesticide use reports from those businesses that are doing applications at school sites. And we have that in a database and that's readily available. As I said, we do a lot of training. My program works a lot on training and getting out there. So we're do doing workshops up and down California. Um, the thing that I think is great about this training, it's at a school site. Um, it's um, hands-on. They're doing a lot of activities. They're literally um, walking around the school site, doing kitchen inspections, um, doing things that they would typically do at their own school site. Um, it is optional for districts to attend as far as the Healthy Schools Act requirement, but I will say uh, every one of our trainings has probably been sold out a couple of weeks in advance, and we um, allow up to 50 people per workshop. It is mandatory, or sorry, mandated that it's train the trainer. What that means is um, we provide the attendee, um, who's typically an IPM coordinator, enough information about IPM and enough resources that they can go back to their district and train the rest of their district. So it's really supposed to be passing on that knowledge. Um, IPM is all about getting a whole team together and everybody and be involved. If, if you, the IPM coordinator is the only person doing IPM, you're really not going to be doing IPM. You're going to be fighting fires left, left and right. We give each district um, a training toolbox, so you're welcome to come up after the session and look at that. And again, that's for training um, and help them show the things they've learned. We've done um, 50 workshops since um, 2002 is when we started doing workshops. We actually have our 55th coming up actually at Kern High School, and we have Mitchell here today to talk about that as well as other stuff that's going on at his district. Um, we've trained about 2,000 people to date, and that's 86% of the districts. Uh, that means 140 are still out there is not trained. However, the districts that have been trained account for 95% of the student population in California. So what that means is those last 140 districts are going to be really small districts, really probably remote. Um, and, and then there's districts that only have five students in them. So that's like when you're looking at diff different district sizes, there's a lot. Um, and so we are going to, for those districts, we're going to try to get to them and actually provide them training one-on-one um, -on -one with us at DPR. And then um, just last year, we did a pilot program about um, turf grass IPM. And so we partnered with UC IPM, Cheryl Weiland down in Southern California, um, and we got some funding from US EPA. And we um, basically, it was a half-day focus just on um, turf, turf health and soil health. And we really focused on keeping your turf healthy so you don't have to deal with a lot of weeds and issues. Um, again, it was very hands-on. So that was very successful. We are doing more workshops both this year and next year. We do a lot of other talks. Um, we go out to um, talk to professionals that work with the school districts. So um, whether it's for continuing education for those applicators, or we also talk to a lot of school dis districts to try to get our message out there um, and talk about school IPM and the Healthy Schools Act. We also here at DPR do um, pest management surveys of schools. We've done five of these um, since, I think, 2002. 
And the reason for that is it really lets us see what schools are doing, um, what they're not doing, how we can help them, what are they struggling with, um, how we can change our program to better help them. Um, and this is just one of the questions that was on there. Um, you know, have you adopted IPM? And about 70% said they have. And then as far as effectiveness, again, seven, about 70% said that they thought it was more effective than what they were previously doing, those more conventional methods. So what's next? For us, um, like I said, we really want to get all the districts trained. That is one of our goals. Um, we also think thinking about pest prevention um, before you even build the school is very important. We just put a new web page up about that, so there's lots of resources about that. Um, and then we also really want to get those districts that are doing really great in IPM to talk to other districts that may be struggling, kind of mentor them. So we're trying to bring in people like Mitchell who can kind of share his story and kind of you know, be a mentor to those other districts. And then we also want to um, do continuing education for um, those pest control business that work with schools to kind of complete the loop. Um, so they understand what schools are up against, you know, the Healthy Schools Act requirements, doing school IPM. So everybody's on the same page and can have conversation about that. And then we are right now in the midst of a huge project. Um, we are doing an 11 video training program. Um, they're going to be short, engaging videos. They'll be readily available on YouTube. Um, as well as social media, and they'll be available on DVDs to school districts. Um, they're going to be focusing on pretty much the basics of IPM, as well as more in-depth on IPM, and also focusing on typical school pests about IPM. We um, will be filming this summer, um, so we're right now working on scripts. We'll be filming this summer, editing this fall, hopefully have those up pretty soon, probably at the latest by January. Um, and this is just one more way that we're trying to get out to those remote districts or people that have trouble getting to our in-person trainings. And I will also say, just related to that, is we do have a child care IPM series video, a series out already on our webpage. So if you're interested in that, um, look for that on our webpage. Um, and then please, anytime, um, I have some business cards in back, please um, call or email us and we're always happy to help um, school districts, public, whoever, about the Healthy Schools Act or school IPM. Thank you. I'm going to um, turn it over to Rob Corley now, who's, gonna, um, who's from the Department of Education. He's a field representative. So he works with the school district um, about he Healthy Schools Act compliance as well as other things. So he'll kind of give you what he's working on. Thank you. I'm, my name is Rob Corley. I'm with the Department of Education. I'm actually outstationed in the Ventura Oxnard area. So I'm down there in um, coastal Southern California, where it's not quite as warm as it is here. So I'm still adjusting. Um, this is a really important topic, and the uh, Department of Pesticide Regulation has done a much better job than the education community at get, about getting the word out. We're catching up. We're working hard on it, but um, thank you for your leadership in this, and, and Lori's unit, and all the people who work with her have just been fabulous. Let me talk through a little bit focusing from the perspective of a school district and how to make it more effective in a school environment setting. Um, why are we doing this? Well, as, as the slide says, it's all about the kids. So let's get into it here. These are the takeaways I'd like you to have at the, after this, this uh, presentation. IPM is a team effort. If it's one person in one office, it's not working. It'll never work. It can't work. It has to be a team and a big team, and we'll talk about who should be on it. Prevention is always better than reacting. You can buy all the cans of Raid and run around squirt and everything, and you'll never, ever beat the insects. You can prevent them in the first place. That's winnable. The spray, you're just never going to be done with it. Every situation is complicated. And this is something most people uh, really have a hard time with, is every school is unique. Every program is different. Where's the child care center? Where's the driveway? Where's the undeveloped portion of the site? Is there a farm next door? Everybody's different. And then uh, finally, communication is key. And, and this is, again, something we often overlook because you're so busy at work is if you don't tell people what you're doing, they don't know what you're doing, they can't help you do it. So let's get into, I can master technology. Um, involve your decision makers. And if there's one thing you take home with you, you have to talk to your bosses. Because if your bosses don't know the importance of what you're doing, they won't fund it, they won't support you, they won't let you go to training, and then you're fighting an uphill battle brag a little bit. You, you deserve it. So brag a little bit. Show how it's important. You have to remind the decision makers who are your superintendent and they change, what, every three years? Your board members and they change every two years. 
they have very short memories. So remind them why this is important. What, remind them this is the law. This isn't something you read about in a magazine. This is the law. It's in two different sections. And we'll talk about our friends in the charter world later on. The key to winning this battle is notifying you when pests are seen. So when the kids run up and tell the playground aide, hey, the gopher holes are back and I, I saw little furry things, and they don't tell anybody. And it, how do you learn about it? You learn about it when somebody's injured and the nurse calls and said, Johnny broke his ankle again. Get out here. By then, you've got a couple generations going. So prevention is key. Information gathering is key. Empower people at the sites to tell you and have a contact person. Tell the secretary who will phone you and say, hey, gophers are back on the east end of the field. That's how you can catch them when they're young, before they breed. It's too late this year if you're fighting gophers. It's too late. They popped. <laughs> I mean, we have a whole million of them out there. Special populations on campuses. Every campus, it seems, has something special. If you have a medically fragile population, if you have a special ed group, special care is needed around them. And what you do in one area of the campus may be different. So be aware of the very special populations. And again, involve the school managers, the office manager, the secretary, the, pr the principal, whoever it is at that particular site. High schools are organized very differently than elementary schools. Engage them, talk to them, have them give you feedback. It makes it a team effort. I move on again. Uh, again, prevention. You guys know this already, but um, timing is everything in prevention. If you wait till after the gopher litters are born, you're chasing a million gophers. If you, not a million literally, but you know what I mean. <laughs> but if you can do it during breeding season or even earlier, then you're chasing dozens. Which is easier to trap, 500 or 12? Because once you control that population and control that population, control that population, all of a sudden it's a very manageable problem. When you're looking at 600 gopher mounds, it's an uphill battle. So again, timing is everything, prevention, involve people. The last one up here about civic center permits. Civic center is a school term. These are the non-school users, the AYSO, Little League, the church groups that come in, bingo clubs, you name it. They all come on. You need to tell them if you're doing an application. Um, Special situations, just again, non-school tenants. Uh, how many schools have a child care center leasing space? How many have a county special ed building? How many have a after school program where the kids do art or something? You, you need to inform all those people. You're on many, many sheets of paper. Um, charter schools on a shared campus. This is more and more common where you have a public school and the, the last wing is leased to a, private, to a charter school, which is a public school but under, under a different set of rules. They say, I'm a charter, I exempted myself from the education code that says I don't have to worry about IPM because I'm a charter. You can't exempt yourself from the food and ag code. You cannot ignore this stuff. So you need to remind them gently but firmly that they are still subject to this and because the school district owns this campus, these are campus-wide rules. This is a negotiation and a process, and you, this is why you need to inform your board members, your superintendent, your CBO, that we have some special needs and we have to work with these people. As you go through, um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute here. Um, District-owned property that's leased out, but you're getting back in a year. You need to start your IPM practices now so you don't walk in on something in a year when you take the property back. Schools near agriculture, um, mainly because of where I work, which is fields and more fields. The key to success here is communication with the adjacent farmers. They don't want an embarrassing situation. Their ag commissioner will rip them apart if anything happens. They don't even know who to talk to. So starting that communication, pushing it together, uh, just talking to the growers, they want to be the good guys. They don't want a spray incident. And believe me, the ag commissioners want nothing less than a spray incident around school. So keep that communication going. You'll find them a good partner, and everybody has to give a little bit. But there are days they do need to apply materials. You just sometimes have to close the campus for a weekend when it, when it happens. There, it, we're in citrus country, so there are a couple times a year, in May and November, when you have a high population, treatment is needed. Your school may have to adapt, so work with them. Um, the last one up here, number six. The law says areas used by students. And the example we've run into is where 
the high school does not have a very good baseball field. It's a very small field. So they use the city park next door. Every day, they go over there and practice. Every time they have a game, they go over there and play. Do students use that city park? Of course they do. <laughs> do you need to do IPM over there? You need to be talking to the city people about using the same practices. My name is Mitchell Perez. Um, I come from Bakersfield. I've uh, been there all my life. I work for the Kern High School District um, to provide a positive learning environment. I like that. Um, that's a key word, that learning environment, for what we're there for, like Brian says. We're there for the students and staff, uh, especially when you get down into uh, the K-1s. Even when the 12s, I mean, I can tell you some stories there because you sometimes wonder where these kids come from. Uh, part of that is parenting. Um, but in order to keep them in an environment, it's expanded, it's come a long ways from the school I've come up to to, to now. Um, but other, just to kind of give you an idea, uh, if you don't know, it's, it's pretty much, a lot of people tell me that, it still, still kind of gets me, wow, that's true. Uh, the Kern High School District is the largest 912 school district in the state of California. Um, it still kind of gives me the chills. I don't, I don't look at it that way. Um, it was started back in 1893. Um, we staff, or we have about 35,000 students annually. Um, we staff about 3,500 staff members, 35,000 students, excuse me. Um, it all comes down to about 18 school sites within the greater Bakersfield. Uh, we got six alternate uh, continuations, which is an alternate school for difficult st students that are not really making it in the real world, uh, which back when my days, they had those continuation schools. And once you talk about vistas and continuations, and that, no one wanted to hear any of that. But it was a good program for ones that were having difficulties. Uh, we have two career technical schools and eight support facilities, and I'm part of the support facilities, out of our maintenance and operations. Um, and that's where we are, maintenance comes from. Um, we have the AC department, the heating department. You're probably familiar with all the departments involved. Um, mine, I kind of get to where uh, I'm a ground group and supervisor originally, but I inherited the IPM program because I initiated it needed to be done uh, because of the previous pest control companies that they had contracted. There was, like I said, there was, at the time I started, there was probably 15 sites. And each site had their own program. Each site had their own contractors. And it was out of control in regards of getting it under control. So keep that in mind. I mean, we have a total of about 34 sites within Greater Bakersfield. We go as far as Arvin, Shafter, Lake Isabella um, areas, and we're still growing. Um, through our maintenance department, though, I've, I've developed a good rapport with a lot of the maintenance people because in the IPM program, if anyone is kind of shy from getting and taking that step, it's, it's really with, with Lori's staff and DPR, it's great because of the resources you get from them. But you'd be surprised on who you get involved with from the superintendency all the way down to the custodian staff and instructors uh, because it involves everybody. And like Rob mentioned, communication from the top down, up down. Um, but with that in mind, our main point is, and my issue is food. Uh, we facilitate the largest meal provider for Kern County. Kind of think about that, 34 sites, these kids got to eat. So we've got large facilities. Um, to manage those at the health department's level, it's very difficult. So I have to work closer with each supervisor for each school site. Kitchen supervisors, plan supervisors, directors, system directors. Um, I'll tell you, it is a challenge. Um, but as long as you're patient, uh, it will work. Um, so I, that's what you got to realize, just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm doing. It's just basically like one of me, but we're still expanding. Um, let me, uh, there's our logo. And this is just kind of a boundary map of our school sites, just to kind of give you an idea. It expands through Bakersfield. Um, all sites are there, and we're still constructing, still growing. Um, and it, it's about a 471 square mile uh, area to cover. Um, I think our population is over 300,000 in Bakersfield. 
So uh, we're growing. Uh, just one of the school logos. I'm not going to bring them all. This is my favorite one. Once a driller is always a driller. I don't know if you've ever heard that logo. Uh, Hawks Centennial. But, uh, but anyway, um, in regard to the techniques, uh, there's some questions that I was asked that are to go ahead and kind of give an insight, and I'll, I'll get into those. Uh, what IPM techniques do I use in the Coronado District? As you can see, uh, the photograph, this is just uh, my truck. I displayed everything out. This likes kind of, it's confusing, but there's not enough room in my trucks to maintain that. But when you get call outs, um, then you've got to find out what you're going for. But these are just some of the items used, and most of them are probably on the table, other than it's, it's, it's been expanded to um, tools. And you'd be surprised what tools that are out there as far as going into, like Rob said, get the can, just spray. Um, I've got that mostly under control as long as the emergency is an emergency and as long as it's not an emergency. So, um, and you can see if you look real good, um, there's items there. All that you probably pretty much see it and on there is here is basically exempt items that I use uh, versus going into directly and depending on the uh, the infestation they call uh, I usually just go within the IPM program um, you can see the ozone generator um, the spiders for pigeon abatement um, wipes I use those a lot sanitization is the simplest way to manage ant infestations uh, the big vacuum cleaner uh, rat zappers um, Exclusion, I do a lot of exclusion, baiting. Um, one of my tools I really like is the, the boroscope. Uh, I do get into bat issues, uh, bird issues, uh, especially when it gets into the classroom atmosphere. Thank you.